Good evening. Everybody have a good afternoon? Yes? All right. Well, we had to call another, call another audible, so we're going to continue on with reverence. I figure we could open it up to a conversational type thing here this evening. Uh, I keep wanting to teach on uh, premillennialism and rapture because Pam asked me to do that for her, but unfortunately her sister's been sick. Pam was sick and then her sister's sick, and so she's uh, helping to take care of her sister, so I told her I'd wait another wait another round until the next Sunday night, and we'll, we'll do it then. And so we'll look at that. So tonight we're going to look at uh, reverence versus irreverence. We're going to look at some more examples that we have, both Old and New Testament. Uh, we're going to open it up for some discussion. Uh, in case there are questions, we have uh, most of our elders that are in the, the room here this evening. Actually, all the elders are in the room here this evening. And so if there are questions, too, then they could feel free to speak up and to be able to uh, answer any of those questions that you have outside of myself as well. But this morning I mentioned that Reverence for God is something that's missing uh, in much of what, as I guess you could say, masquerades for Christianity today. Um, and I'm talking Christendom now, right? Uh, earlier today I was specifically addressing our congregation. But if you think about Christendom, and I talk about uh, just this irreverence that you see in Christendom, what are some examples that may come to mind? Raise your hands. All right. Bands and music. Yeah, bands and music in the sense that it's entertainment necessarily for the individuals, but not necessarily for God. It's also not something that God actually requires. It's something that's added. We know what the scriptures teach about not adding to, not taking away from the word of God as we have in scripture. Uh, what are some other examples? Uh, Lewis? Papacy. I'm sorry? The papacy, the focus. Uh, the, the papacy, yep, ab absolutely, that's, that's another one. Uh, Randy, did you have your hand? Um, oftentimes in prayer, we, we pray to God like he's our next door neighbor or he's yeah. our good friend yeah. instead of God Almighty. And, yeah. and we, we don't pray in, oftentimes in a sense of reverence, which means in fear and awe of God. Yeah. Creator and judge. Yeah, and I think, I know for sure I fall into that category. I, I know, I think probably all of us at one time or another far, probably fall into that category, especially you're driving or just trying to throw up a quick prayer. And, and sometimes we, 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 we almost try to talk to them like, hey, we're, we're, like we're calling on one of our buddies. And so I think that's something, obviously, that, that we could all probably stand to remember that when we approach the throne room of God, that there should be a, a certain amount of, of reverence and kind of clear your head, think for a second, pause for a second, you know, as you get ready to approach God. Any other thoughts or ideas? Uh, I mean, I'm sure there could be many. Uh, Russ? I think the absence of respect for God's word in the Bible. Yes. Uh, many denominations don't respect the word. Yeah. And take it as a value. Yeah. I mean, right here, I think Judy is next, but right here on the corner, uh, what is it, Progress right there where the St. Michael's is? You know, I, I, I take 75, get off on, you know, uh, Dick's there, and take, I take the back way in through the neighborhood, and I always go by that little church every Wednesday and Sunday, and they got the, the big gay pride flag and all the different things, you know. Well, that's flying in the face of the Word of God, as knowing what the Word teaches. And so, yeah, I mean, there's absolutely, that's just one tiny example, but there's lots of examples that can be given, the papacy and others. Uh, Judy. So knowing that as we talk about reverence and how uh, the reverence for God is a quality that's kind of masquerading uh, or ir uh, masquerading in what we call Christendom, right, in all of Christianity. I, I, a lot that disappoints me is that there's so little reverence in the world today for anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much pride and um, egotism that... You know, I, I just think a lot of uh, revering, like, older people or people with more knowledge than us. We, you know, young people don't have as much reverence in the church. In churches, in yep. denominations, people have so much reverence, yes, for, for their leaders, for the, you know, their preacher. They think their preacher does and knows it is everything. Yeah. And um, even in sports, you know, like, I... One thing that makes me impatient is every time a ball player goes up to hit, take his swing at bat, and he's cr crossing himself.
myself on the way up there. And it, it's almost like a joke that they're going to, that Christ is, God is going to help them make a home run. Yeah. Because he has nothing else on his plate. And then if they don't make a home run, it's like, well, are they upset because God, they didn't make a home run? You know, it's a sad statement. I think in this country, Taylor Swift is probably more revered than God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Not just this country. Even. She draws better. You know, <laughs> let, let, let that let that be all you need to hear, right, Barb? I think one of the big irreverences I see is on the TV evangelism. Where it's such a TV evangelism? Um, yeah. thing that it's just all about the money, not about the souls. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's disgusting, a lot of people now. Yeah. Think, because fortunately, they're starting to realize. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, these are all good thoughts, and, and, and it's all accurate, right? And so modern, Christian, modern Christianity, me, me and uh, Randy were just talking about this yesterday. He came by uh, when some of the ladies, Linda was by, and some of the ladies for the women's study. And so me and Randy were talking in the house, and we were talking about kind of this idea of irreverence. And, and, and he mentioned yesterday how much of the church and, and those around Christendom, they have this, this, new, I, this new idea, really, newer idea that, that God's my buddy, right? Like Grandpa God, you know, the God of love. And, hey, you know, he's probably up there. Hey, boys will be boys. And, you know, and, 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 and the idea that I've mentioned here recently that there's more and more people that are, uh, they, they want heaven, but there's not really a hell. God's a God of love. We forget that God's a God of justice and wrath as well as love and mercy. And so we only want to focus on the good. And so we ignore the bad and we turn God into something that, we don't find it in Scripture, right? Uh, for a perfect example was uh, Luke chapter 23. You don't have to turn there, but in Luke chapter 23, you guys remember the story. Jesus is on the cross. You got what? You got, you got a thief on the, on the right. You got one on the left, right? And the one on the right or the left or whatever it was, he, he starts to chide Jesus, right? And, then, and he tells Jesus, and basically then the other thief eventually, uh, once he realizes really who Christ is, he he rebukes him for his irreverence. And he actually utters the words, do you not even fear God? Right? He says, we're here because we deserve to be here. This man's done nothing wrong. Do you not even fear God? Right? And so, you, you know, that's a story that we all know. But that's a good example of this idea that we're talking about, of the lack of reverence that we see in society. I mean, how many times have you heard... Or have you heard people in a conversation, they'll use references like the big guy in the sky. Right? If you go back and you study out Judaism, right, they were afraid to even use the name of God in fear that they may have used it in some form of irreverence so that they may be uh, struck down on the spot for such irreverence, right? So they, they, they try to not even use the name of the Lord in many and most cases. Yeah. Yeah. They all, all bowed their heads. Uh, Russ likes, uh, or not Russ, uh, Ed, he likes watching uh, on, on World Video Bible School. They have those passages videos where they'll show you like different parts of the Holy Land and stuff like that. Me and Christy were yesterday watching the one on Jerusalem, and they were talking about the, the steps that led up. It was like 70 feet up that led to, to getting into the temple. And they were saying how, how they designed it was the steps weren't symmetrical, right? They were offset in different sizes. So the point was, when you were walking up the steps, you were kind of almost bowing forward because you had to pay attention. And so you were almost like in a humble position as you were trying to get up the steps to even enter the proper temple proper. And so it was just interesting uh, how they spe- purposefully, specifically designed it that way so you would have to walk in a way to where your eyes are more focused down and your head is more down as you're coming into the house of the Lord. So it's just something that, little something as little as that, that you know, they took it so seriously that they did those types of things. Um, so reverence, right? Uh, reverence, you know, does not refer to God as the big guy in the sky. It doesn't refer to God as the man upstairs, right? We need to stop. And as, and another thing, I guess you could say, is how often do we hear the o, the OMGs, right? And uh, in in all the different ones where we use God in all these different little references or slangs, and we do so uh, half-heartedly or kind of joking or just just uh, an expression, 
right? But again, when we really look at what is reverence, reverence, biblical reverence for God, much of what we see today, even the lighthearted stuff, falls into the irreverent category. And I said it this morning, I don't think this is something that uh, we talk about enough. Uh, and, and not even just saying here in Lincoln Park, but just in the church. I don't really, you know, in my 17 years now, I can't really recall very many lessons on this topic. And now what we're seeing is as more of cultures invading the church and the world's invading the church, you're seeing the standards in the church are coming down in order to do what? To meet society, to meet culture. Where the come as you are mantras that you see a lot of these community type mega type churches. And wh what is the idea that they're trying to say? That it's okay, it doesn't matter how you come into the presence of God. And yet when I study scripture, it absolutely mattered how you came into the presence of God. Tom? The, uh, some churches, uh, we all know it doesn't matter, so I don't have the name of it. Some churches decide uh, you can come to church whenever you want. And we have 47 services on Sundays. You got a few on Saturday afternoon, so whatever you got time this weekend, you know, stop in. Yeah. Uh, to meet your obligation. It is an obligation. Yeah. And you, and it, you should plan it that way. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to be going out of your way. That should be part of your schedule. Yeah. And, you know, I was talking to one of our members uh, when I got home. She sent me a message, and then I messaged her back, and I sent her an email. And then she, when she understood everything, that she was like, oh, I agree wholeheartedly on certain aspects that we were talking about. And so it was, good, it was a good little message back and forth. But I want you guys to look over to uh, Leviticus chapter uh, 19 for a second. We're going we're gonna to kind of start to go through some Old Testament examples. We're going to look at some New Testament examples. Because it's important that we look at this. Reverence, remember, it is, is honor and respect that is deeply felt and outwardly demonstrated for God. Deeply felt, outward, outwardly demonstrated. Leviticus 19, verse 30. If somebody could read that for me. What verse, David? Leviticus 19, 30. You shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. Okay. I am the Lord. You keep, keep my Sabbaths, right? That's not an option there. Keep my Sabbaths and reverence or revere my sanctuary. What is, what is he telling us there? Uh, what is Moses saying when he records revere my sanctuary? What does that even mean? Hold it in the highest esteem, respectfully. Hold it in the highest uh, esteem, okay? Perfect. So the Bible records uh, reverence as the automatic response that anybody should have as they encounter God's awesome grandeur, right? Let's look at some more. Uh, Numbers chapter 20. Here, I'm going to have somebody look up, uh, Randy, so we're not bouncing all over. Randy, look up Numbers 20 and verse 6. Um, who else wants to do? Uh, Barb, would you look up uh, Judges chapter 13 and verse 20? Judy? Could you look up 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 16? And then, Randy, when you, or if you're at Numbers chapter 20, verse 6, please read yes. that. As for the person who turns to mediums and to spiritists to play the harlot after them, I will also set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. Is that Numbers chapter 20, verse 6? Oh, it's Leviticus. Excuse me. Yeah, All right. yeah. I was listening, and I'm like... Man, he's got a really different translation than I have. Very different translation. It's highlighted in my Bible. Numbers chapter 20, verse 6. Sorry about that. Then Moses and Aaron came in from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Okay. So what happens here? What do we see in this scene? Moses and Aaron, they come to the presence of the assembly, right? They know they're going to be coming into the, uh, the presence of the Lord. And they do what? They prostrate themselves, as I was talking about here this morning. Uh, who had, Barb, did you have Judges? 13 and verse 20. Chapter 13, verse 20. As the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. Okay. Fell with their faces to the ground. Is there a common theme here, right? Uh, now, uh, Miss Judy, you had First Chronicles? 21 to 16? 19. Uh, verse uh, 16. Chapter 21, verse 16. Okay. What chapter? Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Okay, that's, a, that's 
verse 16. 21, 16. <laughs> That's funny. I'm sorry. And Here David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heavens, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders who were clothed in sackcloth fell upon their faces. Okay. There, so the idea here is that there's a certain level of reverence, right, that you see <laughs> Throughout the Old Testament, right, and even into the New Testament, I mean, there's, so, I mean, there's so many examples that can be given, but for time's sake, right, we can only look at so many. So the idea of re reverence, though, for God, it started with God, but God also knows that He's dealing with sinful human beings, right, uh, men and women who are fallen. Isn't that the reason why they got the Ten Commandments in the first place? Isn't that the reason why Moses had to go up on the mountain? Because they spent over 400 years in, in captivity and slavery, and so they didn't really know how to worship God uh, appropriately. They didn't really know how to have proper reverence for God. And so God did what? Not only with the Ten Commandments, as, uh, as Moses went up on Mount Horeb, we also know, brethren, that, that God gave them the law in order so they could know the seriousness of which in which they're to approach God, but in which they're to worship God, and how serious God is about doing what he commands, right? Do you think Nadab and Abihu got the message, right? right? Do you think Uzzah, remember Uzzah got Uzzied? You know, that's, my, that's how I remember it in my mind, right? Uzzah got Uzzied. And, you know, that's, that's an example that we can look up. I mean, he didn't have proper reverence for God. You know, David, he, you know, he wants to bring the, the Ark of the Covenant back to the capital, and they, give it, they have, they have the, the, the oxen, and they got the brand new cart, and they got the, you know, the, 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 the band members, so to speak, and they got people dancing and dressed up, and they're leading this procession, and they, it's even ground, and the Ark's going to tip over, and Uzzah, you think, is good in his heart, reaches up to try to brace it, to keep it from hitting the ground, you think a good thing, and yet, in God's eyes, that was what? Right? It was disobedient, it was irreverent, he's not allowed to touch it. And they weren't actually uh, transporting it properly either, which then goes on to a whole other story, right? And so, so you continue to look at this. In the Old Testament, God taught the Israelites how to show proper reverence uh, by giving them hundreds of laws. Laws on purity, laws on holiness, laws on worship. Deuteronomy chapter 5, the whole book of Leviticus, right? Uh, all you have to do is look at that stuff. And so knowing that God is dealing with sin-filled humanity, he does not uh, just allow us to just worship willy-nilly however we want. He gives sp 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 specific, I kind of spit that word out, it's like, but, the, 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 <laughs> specific um, rules and regulations. You know, sometimes when you speak in front of people, sometimes the words just don't come out correctly. And in my mind, I heard, I, I've seen it. That one did not want to come out, right? And so his presence dwelt with Israel in the Ark of the Covenant, did it not? Uh, what about the holies of holies? In Leviticus 16 and 2, I could just read that one for you if you want. In Leviticus 16, 2, it says... The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil for the mercy seat, which is on the ark, or he will die. So he's not to enter the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat at any time, or he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Well, what's the idea here? The idea here is that there's certain commands that are given, only certain individuals are allowed to enter, and then once a year, right? And then on top of that, you have to enter with proper reverence, right? There were uh, sacrifices that had to be made. There were things that had to be done in order to come into the presence of the Lord and be there acceptably, right? And so I want you to kind of think about this idea. Right, that we see that's pervasive throughout the Old Testament, and then compare it to modern day Christianity. Compare it to what is our mindset? What is our thought processes? What do our outward actions relay to God as far as messaging? Right? And so that's where I ask the question is it possible to become overly casual? Uh, overly flippant, if you will, in our approach to worship, 
in our approach to God, the things that we speak, the expressions and the phrases that we use, how we, how we uh, come before God in prayer. I mean, the list can really go on and on. And, and that's kind of what me and Randy were talking about a little bit yesterday, is that it's, there's really been a watering down of faith and reverence and worship and really many things that can be added to the list in the last so many uh, probably decades. Uh, Judy and then Ed. just saying, just pray this prayer with me. Just say this. Just say a few words. Just And then you're all good. And yep. so many people watch that and they think that's truth. They think that's it. All they have to do is say, come into my life today, Jesus. Yeah. And then you're good. Yeah. And that, I mean, thousands of people are watching that on TV rather than worshiping yeah. and studying the scriptures. And that's what kills me, too, about, like, man, right, and our titles, right? The fact that you have human beings who lead various congregations of what they call Christianity, and they expect you to call them reverend. Reverend. Reverence is only used in the scriptures to, in, in regard to God. Right? And reverence, as I, as I told you guys this morning, it's the idea of you have such profound respect and honor for God that you realize is infinitely greater than you could ever be. And yet you have men who want to be called reverend. I remember I asked somebody, well, you know, what should you, I call you reverend, pastor? I said, well, first of all, never call me reverend. I said, but pastor, I understand what you mean by that. That's fine. If, if we're doing funerals, they want to put something. So I say, pastor is fine because I know how the world uses it. Ed? Um, I, I know we've been talking about, um, you know, uh, this being reverent when we come here. Yep. But um, it, for me, uh, it, it's before we get here. Yep. And it, it is every day, all the time. So we, got, we, we don't want to limit it to just when we come here, we flip a switch and we're reverent. No, exactly. It's, it's a lifestyle. It drives our whole life. Yeah, absolutely. Because you you can also worship God in different aspects of your life, right? Uh, in different things uh, that are outside of the assembly. And so we need to make sure that when we go before God, it's with the appropriateness of mind and heart and spirit, right? Uh, and so how we define ourselves or how we... Uh, show ourselves to others, our outward expression, really, of our faith, does it, does it, is it defined, would others define it as somebody who's holy? Do you impress upon another individual the holiness that you have uh, within you because of who you worship, right? God says, be holy for I am holy, right? And is that, and you think about that, is, is that a suggestion or is that a command, right? Are we not to be set apart from the world? We're not to be as the world, and it's the idea of holiness. And so the purpose of, of these strict rules that we see in Leviticus uh, and Deuteronomy and, and all throughout the Old Testament is to define that holiness, uh, is to define holiness and impress upon mankind the necessity for reverence unto God. What about the New Testament? In the New Testament Christianity, reverence for God is demonstrated by what? It's our willingness to voluntarily die to self, and live for God. You guys remember Romans 12, 1 and 2, we talk about it all the time, right? That we are to transform our minds, and by transforming our minds, we can prove to others what's good, acceptable, and perfect, right? But you, you have to transform your heart and your mind with the Word of God, so that way, eventually, as you do that, then outwardly, you start to express uh, and show the world the love that you have for God, uh, the respect that you have for God, that it's no longer about me, it's all about him. And oftentimes, does our worship in Christendom, does it say that it's all about me or does it say it's all about God? Many of, much of what you see, as I said, masquerading as Christianity, it's about the individuals and the entertainment factor more so than it is about honoring and revering a holy and righteous God. Thoughts or comments? Uh, Jim? I, I was just remembering there was, uh, long before we came to Lincoln Park, there was a different church that we visited. And we, we sat down with the elders uh, to decide whether or not we were going to place membership there. And 
during that conversation, uh, I, you know, I was expressing some of my reservations about that yeah. particular group. And one of the things that I told the eldership there is, you know, when we enter into your auditorium on a Sunday morning, one of the things that we see is in between, you know, a song or a prayer or something, there's just this general level of murmur that you can yeah. hear within the auditorium. Yep. There, there's no silence, there's no, you know, and, and it was, it just felt irreverent. Yeah. And that was actually the word I used at the time. And one of those elders even dropped his hat because they knew. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you're absolutely right in, 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 of that, in of that situation, and you handled it correctly. But that's why I, I felt, you know, the more I, I've had conversations with all of our elders, uh, specific, specifically Randy and Lewis here uh, as of late, you know, it's just, uh, it, you're seeing this more and more. We're seeing this, not just at Lincoln Park, but all over. Uh, and so, you know, we said, hey, enough is enough. It, it needs to be addressed. It needs to be brought back to the forefront of our minds. Because I don't think this is nothing. I'm not, I don't think I'm really blowing your mind uh, with anything here. But isn't it sometimes necessary to kind of bring things back to the forefront of your mind? It's easy to start to say, to start to dumb things down, to start to uh, loosen the standards, to try to you know, put more people in the seats. But God's people, his true people, have always been a remnant. And we're always going to be a remnant. You know, even if you were to take every Lord's member in the, in the country, we're only maybe 1.1 million people in a country of 365 million. What does that tell you? We're, we're not even 1%. We're a remnant. And that's assuming that everybody in the church is saved. It's like putting the frog in the cold water and turning the heat on. He doesn't realize he's being cooked until it's yeah. too late. Once you, your standards fall, you no longer have any standards. Yeah. And it sneaks up on us over time. And we accept it, we accept it, we accept it because that's the way things are. Yeah. But at some point in time, you have to say, as we're doing now, let's stop yeah. and reconsider where we're going with this because... It's not in a good direction. Yeah. And it's not, in my mind, pleasing to God. Yeah. What your discussion was this morning of, of what's happening in the, not just this congregation, but congregations yeah. across the brotherhood. Yeah. Some point in time, you have to stop and say, we need to correct this. Yeah. And, and like I said, this isn't just what, you know, as I said, this is something I do see here with some, not all, obviously. But it's also, as I talk to other ministers and other elders here locally, it's happening in all the congregations, and it's been happening, and it's something that needs to be addressed. Look over to Matthew chapter 6 for a second. When you guys get to Matthew chapter 6, you guys remember when Jesus' disciples, they asked him, hey, teach us how to pray. I want you to see something in the very beginning, Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 9. We're not going to read the whole prayer. We know the Lord's Prayer. But I want you to, to notice a specific word in verse 9. Somebody read verse 9 as you get there. Matthew 6, verse 9. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. All right, stop. His, te his disciples are asking him, Lord, teach us how to pray. John's disciples teach him, them how to pray. Lord, teach us how to pray. And he says, okay, pray then in this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What is the definition of hallowed? Holy, set apart as holy, right? And so we are to treat the name of God with reverence. And so it is common to hear people, as I was saying, not using earlier the name of God in reverence in different expressions. But Jesus is telling us the first thing that should come out of your mouth is blessed be the Lord whose name is, uh, is not only is holy, but it's hallowed, right? It's to be revered. And that's something that Jesus starts out with. There has to be a, a sense of reverence as you enter into prayer to Almighty God. Thoughts on that? Recognition of God initially sets the tone for everything else in your prayer. Yep. And if you come in explaining to why you what you need and why you need it without giving him the glory of the mercy he is going to present <coughs> to you, that prayer is not going to go any further than the ceiling. Yeah. As far as he's concerned. Yeah. Even though we say, in Jesus' name, 
that the catch all. Yeah. You know, uh, God says, no, figure out who I am first. And I, you just a spring back to one of your points. Sometimes the, the sermons of fire and brimstone, remember those? Yep. You know, they, they brought in the acknowledgement of who God is and what he could do. Yeah, with fear and, and trembling. Cons- and the consequences <laughs> of not doing it. In this country, in its laws, and they lack consequences for things yeah. that you do. And that's what's permeating in this, into our religion. Yeah. And when you go back, and, and there's really dozens of more passages that we can look at in the Old Testament that showed what happened when there was irreverence towards Almighty God. I'm talking, many died. Tens of thousands died because of irreverence. And yet, you know what I mean? And, and yet we have this idea and this, this, this really pervasive attitude of irreverence that has really been entering in for some time now. And it's just time that we start to call it what it is. And so when we understand God's nature, we talk about love and mercy at nauseam, and nauseam, nauseam, but we don't talk about wrath. Isn't God a God of justice and wrath just as much as he's a God of love and mercy? And so we show reverence by taking seriously his hatred for sin. If God hates something, those who profess to uh, follow and be disciples of God should hate what God hates. Now, when we're trying to convert people, we're trying to deal with the world, we deal with them with gentleness and love, but we also don't, Uh, condone or we don't uh, condone sin right we condemn sin and we have to let them know that while i understand what you're saying god has a level of expectation for all who look to call upon his name and it's okay to call sin sin and it's okay to to really let people know that if you continue in your way that you're going to be you're going to fall under not of the love and mercy of god but you're going to fall under the wrath of god ed things that should help us to be reverent to God is to understand the characteristics of him. Yep. I mean, for example, uh, no beginning and no end. Uh, I, I thought a lot about that, but it, it, it puts you in awe of something like that. And, and uh, being everywhere all at once. That's another thing. There's, there's characteristics of God that should make us understand that he's awesome. Yeah. Amen. And, and he deserves. Let's flip God. over to Romans chapter 1 verse 18. And this is kind of going to go hand in hand with what you're saying there. Romans chapter 1 verse 18. Now we'll have somebody read that once you get to it. <clears throat> For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Okay. What did we just learn in that verse? Yeah. Right? We talk about God's love and mercy, but what does this verse say? God's wrath. It talks about God's wrath, right? Because when you accept God, you don't just get to accept the loving God. You, get to, you have to accept God for all that he is. And that's his love as well as his wrath. And we have to show people that that God's wrath is going to come upon the sons of disobedience. It's going to come upon the unrighteous. And that's why, you know, 1 Thessalonians, uh, 2 Thessalonians actually, chapter 1, 6 through 10, it talks about the same thing when Jesus returns, right? Taking vengeance on two groups of individuals, right? Those who don't know God and those who are disobedient unto God. Uh, you know, Second Timothy chapter, no, Second Peter chapter two, around verse twenty-two, it talks the same thing. That it would have been better off uh, for somebody to never even come to know the righteousness of God, to have come to know in it, and then just to turn away from it. He says, "You're like that pig in the mire, like that dog in the vomit." It's a verse of no, very difficult to turn things around. Amen. And they don't want to hear that. But there are times when people, individuals, 
must hear that in order to change their life and to wake them up and turn them around. Yeah, for sure. First Peter, let's uh, turn over there. First Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. First Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is, it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Okay. But like the Holy One who called you, be yourself holy. All right? Be holy yourself. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm going to allow you to take Tuesday, Thursdays, and the weekend off. But at least, you know, try to be holy once in a while. I mean, is that, that's not what your translation says? No, it says you are to be holy as I am holy. Holy when? All the time. Right? Now, we know that it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean we're going to be blameless, right? Uh, like even Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, many of them who said that the, who the scripture says they were blameless, it doesn't mean that they were sinless. It just means that they, they strove to live holy lives. And they stubbed their toe of sin every once in a while. And they made some bad choices once in a while. And they made some bad decisions. And yet, they were found blameless in God's eyes. Why? Because each and every day, they strove to be the best they could be. Uh, and to be holy, to be righteous, to live according to the commands of God. That's why Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Yeah, it's your love for God that causes you to realize that I don't live for self any longer, but I live for God. I live for his uh, will to be done. I live for him to be glorified and to be honored. We're not perfect. We're imperfect people. Amen. We will sin, but we don't walk in that sin. We yeah. don't live in that sin. Yeah. And we recognize our sin and ask God for forgiveness. Yeah. And we get right back up and walk the proper path. Yeah. Look over at Titus chapter 2. And then we'll get ready to close this down here in a minute. Titus chapter 2, verse 12. And as you're getting there, the idea of this verse that we're about to look at is that reverent people desire to say no to ungodliness. Titus chapter 2, verse 12. Somebody read. Because we're supposed to be set apart. I won't raise my hand again. Go ahead. But because we're supposed to be set apart. Yeah. As they were. And these great men that we talk about, they were set apart and people knew that. Yeah. Amen. And they should know that about the church. You know, God's priest, God's kingdom. Titus 2.12, somebody read that. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Okay. Instructing us to deny ungodliness, to deny worldly desires, to live sensibly, to live righteously and godly in this present age. So with all of this information tonight, with the sermon this morning, we should show reverence by God by learning how to truly worship God. What does God expect of us? You could just do a whole series of studies on worship from Genesis to Revelation. And you would come away probably with a very different mindset of what worship to God ought to look like. And the attitude that we should have as we come into God's presence to give worship to him. And so true worship is not our favorite song. It's not confined to an emotional experience. It's not synonymous with these tingly feelings because of, because of how great the, the band sounds and the light shows and just I get the sense of just, uh, just emotions welling up in me. Are the emotions welling up into you because of the experience? Or is the emotion welling up in you because, well, maybe your heart has been pricked by the word of God? What do you think is going to change more hearts? The word of God or an emotional experience? The word of God. And so that's something that we must always keep in mind. We worship in spirits when our hearts are abandoned before the Lord. What does it mean to abandon your heart before the Lord? Tom? Tom? Put the Lord first, right? And, and that's something I've often said that we are, a, uh, we are to be a, a, an other-centered, not self-centered. It's been a while since I said it, but we are to be others-centered, 
not self-centered. We are to be Christ-centered and not self-centered. So you put Christ first. You put others first. You put your spouse first. You put your children first. And then somewhere along the way, Dave will, somebody will throw Dave a bone. Judy and then, um, then Randy. As a child in the Baptist church, a slogan they had was joy. Jesus, others, yourself. Yep. So if you keep joy in your heart and you always have Christ first and then others and then yourself. Amen. Randy? I think sometimes we've lost the meaning of loving the Lord's church. Mm -hmm. In Acts 20 and 28, he gave his life and shed his blood for yeah. us. And I think we don't think about that deeply and seriously enough. Do we love the Lord's church that he died for? Yeah. And I think that would change a, a lot of our mindsets and our attitudes and our actions. Yeah. And that's why it's important to have these kind of conversations, what real, true worship looks like. I know a lot of Christians who don't love themselves. How can you love, how can you love the church and your brother and, and, and others when you don't even love yourself? And so, you know, we could have a whole long conversation based on, on that type of mindset as well. Any other comments? As we teach people to become Christians, yep. <coughs> yes, we teach here, believe, baptize, but we got the five steps. Boom, get that in, yep. get them wet, boom, you're in, man. During that process, we have constantly have to <coughs> reinforce the fact that this is a God that means what he says. Yeah. There is a time when you're going to have to stand before him and give an account. And it, it's scary, but it's true. And that's the beginning of reverence for God, because he's going to judge us. And the second thing I would say was, don't be afraid of saying what the Bible says. Yeah. Because God is saying it. Amen. It's not me. Yeah. It's God. And we can always fall back on that. Yeah. Because I can show you in Scripture that this is God's word. It's yeah. not me. And that's why oftentimes, as we're studying with people or having conversations with people, I said, hey, if you got your smartphone, if you got the physical copy of the, Bob, uh, the, uh, the Bible, open it up. Why? I'll get you next. Open it up because if you're if you're just giving them information, well, that's your opinion, Barb. But if I show you what it says, now your qualm isn't with me, uh, Patrick. Um, I know we got to go. No, we're, we're good. Not we're not there. But I'm, I'm reading uh, John 15. Yep. 12 through 17. This is my commandment that you love one another, just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this that you lay down. One lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I call, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, He may give to you. This command, I, this I command you, that you love one another. I think um, Randy was saying this about how love was supposed to happen in the church. Love was supposed to happen another. I think people see this verse and some other verses. Mm -hmm. um, maybe right before um, the Lord, uh, he, he teaches them how to pray, give them the Lord's yeah. a prayer. He tells them, don't think that the uh, you'll be heard for the many words yes. that the Gentiles say. So, and how... Um, at, when the, at the crucifixion, the veil was torn. Yep. So now we don't have this veil between. There's no separation. We can go. So people think that there's all that formality, all that seriousness, all that. And Jesus is calling us friend. We're his friend. We can. We look at it differently. But they're looking at it <laughs> with very you know, small view and yeah. narrow minded, not looking at the o the obedience and how he's calling us to yeah. obey his father. How he says, I, I can't do anything that my father didn't tell me to do. I can only do what my father told me to do. Yeah. There's so many things that go along with that love and that obedience and o obeying. They just see the, well, he's my friend, and we don't have to, we can, all this other stuff is done away with. Yeah. And I think that's the start of some of this. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely, you can look at that, but that's where people don't look at the full context of what they're talking about in the scriptures, because how many of your friends ever said to you, hey, you're my friend if you obey me? And the, the <laughs> thing is, the kind of friend that he is, okay, how about this? If somebody here, physically on earth, died for you, saved your life, yeah. saved your life, you would thank them, 
be great, be kind, do all kinds of things for them. You revere them, you love them, you do whatever if they, if they save your life. Mm. This is the kind of friend Jesus was for us. Yeah. He laid down my life for his friends. He laid down his life for us. So that's the kind of obedience and reverence and that we should have. Gratitude. Stuff, yeah. we, we forget that. And that's why they kept reminding the, the Israelites over and over. Remember, I'm the God who brought you out of, out of Egypt. Yep. I'm the guy who did these things for you. That's all we remember every week, so we could yeah. we don't let it slip. That yeah, he's, he's that kind of friend who died. For us. And that's why you know what I mean. Uh, we were talking yesterday. You know why God didn't want the Israelites to keep all the chariots and the, and the horses and, and 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 all these and, and all those different things. Why? Because then all of a sudden you start to rely on your own might, your own power, and not on God. Right? There's a reason why He wanted Gideon to to narrow down the field, right, to a few hundred. There's so many different examples that you see. How God uh, was, in order for you to realize what God was doing for you, he actually oftentimes would put you at a disadvantage, then force you to do what? Have faith. Have faith. Trust. And which, so, is, which is the pre prequel to obedience. Yeah, obedience. So this conversation could keep going, so we'll, we'll pause it here. Uh, we, could, we could touch on it again here uh, in a couple of weeks. But hopefully in a couple weeks, uh, Pam will be back, and we're going to jump into... Uh, uh, she had questions about rapture and premillennialism uh, that some of her family had, and so we're going to jump into that here in a couple of weeks. Uh, we all call Pam and tell her to be here next. Yeah. Well, Pam wasn't feeling good the two weeks ago, and now her sister's not feeling good. So I bless her. You know, I said, hey, you know, hey, go, go be with your sister. I said, I said, we'll kick that can down the road a couple of weeks. So, Russ, would you close us with a prayer? Father Jeremiah tells us that uh, Israel had become so evil that they didn't blush anymore. And I'm afraid, Father, this country is doing the same thing. We don't know how to blush. And we've given ourselves over to evil. And uh, Father, help us to fight against that terrible step of, of not knowing Father, help us to be like <coughs> Jeremiah said, to, to look at our values and our integrity and our character so that we can measure up and be a holy people. Bless us, Father, as we study, as we take your word 